We are live. Hello and welcome to The Lion Show. My name is Robert Lyon, your favorite host, your favorite business coach. Today we have the great opportunity to talk to Jason Hubbard. He's an outbound sales specialist. He's been in tech and startups and just doing amazing stuff. So Jason, why don't you just kind of introduce yourself and kind of tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you're up to. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, So my name is Jason Hubbard. I run a a technology enabled uh, growth services company called Demand Magic. Uh, and really what we're trying to solve is, you know, getting people to market quicker and uh, trying to cut through a lot of the day-to-day stuff that outbound reps and teams are dealing with where, you know, for most of those, they're spending as much as 80% of their time just trying to get conversations going. So trying to short circuit that and get reps spending more time actually having conversations. And a big part of that is getting them aligned and working with demand gen and marketing much more closely instead of in, you know, kind of the silos that they've been doing. You know, I've been in startups and tech pretty much my entire career, uh, you know, slash entire life on the startup side, you know, come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, And, you know, a lot of this has come from what I've seen in the industry for the last several years, where it's harder and harder to get in particular outbound teams to be, you know, effective, you know, really at all, but especially cost effective. And you're seeing that with a lot of the uh, layoffs going on right now in the tech space where, you know, outbound SDR, BDR teams are the ones that are being, uh, you know, kind of decimated within these layoffs in some of these tech companies more than any other department or role. And it all really comes back to those central problems. And it's become really, really hard to do outbound. So outbound is a huge part of, so I do business coaching. Um, when I when I coach people, I always try and get a an outbound system always try and get the whole the whole cadence, you know, email, cold call, LinkedIn, social. And I just hammer them. It's definitely changed. It's definitely getting harder. Why do you think it's kind of like hitting this point? Is it like robot blockers or blocking calls and emails? Is it nobody has money anymore? Is it like, you know, what what, what is your, your thinking on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we're all sort of victims of our own, uh, you know, things that we've been employing the last 10, 15 years. So I think most of the outbound model has really been predicated on, uh, you know, this idea that we can go out and hire a bunch of, you know, early stage salespeople, you know, for a lot of them, their first position they've ever had uh, in sales for a lot of them's first job they've ever had. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to come in, we're going to equip them with, you know, a little bit of training. I mean, heck, in a lot of cases, we're not even getting that, but we're going to set them up with some tech that's going to allow them to be able to send emails at scale. It's going to allow them to be able to call at scale. We're going to give them a lot of data that gives them access to you know, all of this contact information and stuff like that. We're going to give them LinkedIn Navigator where they can go out and send in mails and, you know, uh, connection requests and stuff like that. And, you know, we've, we've all sort of leaned on that side of things where, you know, the technology is enabling us to do more and more at scale. And so, you know, because we've been able to do that at increasing levels of scale, you know, the attitude has been if we pour enough into the top, we've got enough reps doing this, then we're going to have something significant come out the other side of it. But of course, that's not sustainable. Uh, and you wind up in exactly the scenario that we're in where, you know, gatekeepers like Google and Microsoft and stuff like that on the email side have gotten increasingly sophisticated. Yeah. Um, they're in particular targeting and clamping down on people leveraging, you know, self acceleration platforms like sales loft or outreach or, you know, whatever. Uh, LinkedIn, of course, continues to tighten things up on that side. You know, it was a huge, huge thing last year whenever they severely restricted the number of connection requests and in-mails that you could do. And so all of those channels are getting more and more difficult. Phones getting really hard, especially with the changes that happened with COVID. So, you know, uh, direct dial phone numbers are increasingly hard to get your hands on. And if you do, you're usually paying through the nose on it. And even then, most people aren't picking up the phone. And so... You know, all of that's a recipe for where we're at right now, where just adding more butts and seats and adding more tech is not driving results anymore. And it's increasingly getting <laughs> to a point where, uh, you know, you know, those, those teams are just not effective. And, you know, a lot of this really came, you know, hammered home to me at the last, you know, company that I was running growth at where, you know, I've built and managed multiple BDR teams. I had an experienced BDR manager directly under me, you know, taking care of the day to day of it, you know, and in spite of that, in spite of the fact we had one of the most world-class CDPs, customer data platforms with intent signals and stuff like that, that, you know, just about any company would just kill the half. So we knew exactly who to be reaching out to and what companies were qualified. In spite of all of those things, 
we could get barely get an outbound team to be to a place where it was like, mm, this makes sense. And in fact, we were sitting there looking at it and going, I don't know, should we pull the plug on this and just focus on other things or not? And so, I mean, when you've got that much in your favor and you're still struggling, it tells you pretty clearly that something's off. Yeah. <clears throat> and like you said, you've been in the startup world for a while. So have you, you back in the day, were you able to build one of these systems and just like crush it and just like cash in all day? Like, is it like was oh, it I'm, night and day it, now? <laughs> in, in the early days, I was one of the worst offenders. So, you know, I mean, I got I bought Pardot back before, you know, just about anything. Anybody was using marketing automation uh, mm -hmm. before they were even acquired by Salesforce. So, uh, you know, they were still an independent. <laughs> Whoa outside of uh, uh, Atlanta. Um, and one of the very first things I did when I got my hands on it was I went out and bought, you know, a license to built with. And, you know, the company at the time, you know, our ICP was basically anybody on Salesforce. If you weren't on Salesforce, you, we couldn't sell to you. If you're on Salesforce, you were a target customer. Mm -hmm. And so I pulled Salesforce technographics out of built with. And all I got for email addresses were generic, like sales app, marketing <laughs> app, stuff like that. And I loaded in tens of thousands and started hammering away at those. Pardot, like two days later, instituted something where you had to click a box confirming that you understood you weren't allowed to do such things. So <laughs> I have to assume it was, it was what we had done. Uh, otherwise, it was just a coincidence. So uh, I've been there. I've done that. I've been the worst offender on that side of things and you know, did it at a time when you know you could get away with that type of stuff and actually see results come from it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, like I said, you know, you fast forward, only so many people can do that type of thing. And I mean, it's the same thing for basically all, you know, quote unquote growth hacks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, growth hack doesn't hang out there very long before other people catch wind of it, start, you know, exploiting the same thing. And then you know, your target audience gets used to it or reacts to it. And so it's no longer viable. And, you know, we're in, we're in kind of a longer tail, longer cycle version of that where, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've had, you know, new pieces of tech and stuff like that continue to come on the scene that's allowed people to, to be able to kind of extend the life of it. But it's getting to the point where, yeah, there's not a whole lot out there as far as green fields, uh, you know, channels that people haven't tried to leverage something like this and, you know, whatever. And so, yeah, you know, you're really kind of back to square one of like, how do we do this from a best practices standpoint? Yeah, we're kind of getting sobered a little bit. I feel like all the conversations I'm having with marketers behind the doors is, well, what we were doing isn't working anymore. We don't know what to do. <laughs> well, we'll figure it out. So let's let's step onto that point where, what do you think we can do to pivot our outbound efforts now to get results? Yeah, so actually, uh, you know, one of my clients is uh, Rev Genius. So they're a, a, a community of salespeople, sales professionals, stuff like that. Um, and so some of us on that side of things have actually been getting together on a weekly basis on LinkedIn uh, and talking about what we've you know called outbound 2.0, um, you know, and basically saying all for all the reasons we've talked about on here, things are broken. So where do we go from here? What do we uh, what do we do with this? And so, uh, you know, for anybody that wants to join, it's Thursdays at one o'clock on LinkedIn Live. Uh, cool. But uh, yeah, and just trying to get some of the leaders and experts and you know thought people uh, thought leaders in space together to sort of bounce things back and forth. But for me at least. The way that this plays out is, uh, you know, outbound BDR teams, SDR teams need to be owned by marketing slash growth, as opposed to under sales, where they've been for, you know, most of this period of time. You're starting to see more and more wind up in, on that, you know, demand gen side of things. Uh, but I think it's still the minority, you know, and have them running in tandem with and coordination with other demand gen initiatives. Um, and so, you know, this was the other piece or the other side of the coin that was driven home for me, you know, at the last company that I was at. Outbound in and of itself was not particularly effective or working. But the other side of it is, is I started running combined ABM motions, you know, coordinated campaigns between what the outbound team was doing and what demand gen was doing. And what I saw there was really striking in that, uh, you know, we were converting accounts that we had targeted um, under that, you know, dull motion uh, at about 50% higher than what we were doing, uh, just targeting them from a demand gen standpoint. This was reflected in our cost on running ads and getting, uh, you know, people to convert off of that. Uh, so our cost structure was similarly about 50% lower on uh, converting to a meeting off of a ad conversion. And 
but you know the other really interesting thing was is 60 to 70 percent of those conversions were not people replying to the rep so you know i could show that hey we're a whole lot more efficient we're a whole lot more effective at converting but very little of that is coming through with people actually replying to a rep in their outbound effort most of them were actually coming to the website you know poking around and ultimately filling out a form many reasons why that may be but at the end of the day like it really highlights that in silos marketing demand gen was doing a a good job uh, in a silo, the outbound team was not particularly effective. But when you combined those motions uh, and added that you know personal touch and additional channels on that side of things, it made everything much more efficient and effective. Cool. So you're saying marketing and your outbound teams need to be kind of in alignment and doing the same thing. And then whenever anybody comes into the world, they need to be reaching out to those people. Is that kind of a simplified version of what you said? Give give credit and attribution to those outbound reps for what they're doing, even if somebody didn't reply directly to them. Because, mm. you know, again, I was able to know definitively that, you know, this is having a significant impact in our ability to get in front of and convert these people, even if it's not, you know, them replying directly to them. Right. Um, but, you know, the flip side of this and the reason why not everybody's doing it is like, that's hard to do. It's complicated. Yeah. You know, it takes a lot of alignment between teams. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of building out of processes and tech. You know, you have to be able to do things like, you know, be able to do proper account scoring or have a good, you know, CDP in place where you can say, hey, these are our priorities. We've got a system for then distributing those to both reps as well as your demand gen team that you're going to be able to then load those same people and companies and bad platforms and run ads at them at the same time um, that you've got, you know, consistent messaging, you're leveraging the same campaigns same conversion points, stuff like that. So like, you know, none of that stuff is easy. I don't want to, you know, no. I, you know, let people think that, you know, like that's an easy silver bullet to just go implement. Like you've got to be pretty sophisticated in what you're doing. I don't think outbound's ever been necessarily easy. I mean, maybe just pick up, pound and dial you know that's still hard and scary so yeah so so what um what we noticed and how how i pivoted uh as we used to do cold call cold email linkedin twitter you know hit them up on social and now instead of um just the cold outreach we have to give them something so we'll, we'll either go to their website film a real quick video and then send them that with a link to either you know watch the video and show them how we can help them and then they can click a button or we give them a free course or we give them something of value to hook them in. And that that's kind of how we pivoted. And that's kind of how our outbound efforts have, you know, worked, you know, because they stopped working. They was just blowing money basically for a little while there. And then I was like, well, we got to do something else. So free course, free, you know, ebook or whatever. And then once they come in, then we call them and then we email them and then we, we hit them up. So that, I think we're, we're both in alignment with that, man. That's pretty. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, more, more than ever content is king. Yeah, uh, you have to have value add. Otherwise, you're just not going to get anywhere. Yeah. And building audiences is, is big and, and things like that. And I don't know, the times are changing, but I you have to have an outbound thing, I believe, because ads are getting more expensive. Everything's getting more expensive. You have to make sure that you are converting everything that you possibly can. And I like how you said combining your marketing efforts with your outbound. I mean, it's just, my, my only thing is I'm used to the world of, you know, it's like a dog eat dog where like we only pay commissions to like SDRs and closers and things like that. So that is a huge shift to just consider it as part of your marketing effort and part of your marketing budget. Kind of well, want to. I mean, even even in the dog eat dog commission based world, I mean, I've still run uh, you know outbound teams under that model, but doing it in coordination with uh, you know demand gen. Uh, but like I said, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, when I'm doing that. If it's a named account that rep is responsible for going after that ultimately comes through, you know, an ad or fills out a form on the website or whatever, I still treat that as if somebody replied to an email or answered the phone call or whatever for that rep. Mm. Because again, I'm able to definitively go in and show like they are moving the needle and making us much more, you know, uh, effective at what we're doing demand gen wise. And it's much more likely they're going to come through one of those inbound channels. And it's much more likely that they're going to, it's going to take less effort, less cost to do so. A lot more KPIs, <laughs> a lot more sheets, <laughs> spreadsheets to fill out. <laughs> it sounds right. It sounds like the way to do it, man. That's, that's incredible. Um, so I, I don't know. I either want to talk about uh, your startups and startup journey, or 
I guess let's just listen. Let me just break this down. What is a technology enabled growth service agency? Because that's a mouthful. <laughs> What's what, like, what, what? Don't break that down for me. Both at the personal level and lessons learned, uh, you know, professionally. The last time I ran a growth agency, uh, I learned the hard way. I can't scale a business if I'm being a CMO and marketing department in a box for clients. Mm. Uh, you know, I can only do that for so many. I can't afford to go hire somebody at that level of, you know, seniority or capability. And so, you know, you can, it can be a decent lifestyle business, but it ain't going to scale. Um, mm-hmm. and it's also, uh, you know, very susceptible to lots of ups and downs, you know, because you're either, you know, fully committed, you know, servicing clients, in which case you're not building pipeline or anything like that. And then when you inevitably have churn, it's like, Oh crap! Now I got to go put on my sales hat and go do that for a while, and you know try and backfill. So you know that was the motivation for coming at it from this other angle. Uh, but the other piece to it is, you know, so what I'm doing is either I've got some homebrew homebrewed tech, as well as some you know companies that I've uh, partnered with, you know, white label or you know leverage their stuff plus oh. you know, services to be able to to more effectively do that. And so most of what we've been talking about, about, you know, that kind of more sophisticated engine, um, Mm -hmm. you know, for growth and demand gen, uh, you know, that's really what my goal is, is to come in and help build that for organizations with a goal and an eye to handing over, you know, 80 to 90% of it to somebody internal after that's been built. So, you know, I'll come in, I'll work with them, I'll build that out, I'll implement the tech and the processes and stuff like that. Uh, and then there's some kind of minor pieces of it if they want us to continue to manage like SEO or manage paid campaigns or something like that or retain us on a you know kind of consulting advisory basis, then we'll hang on and do those things. But at the end of the day, the goal is to get these companies kind of up and off the ground with a world class, you know, growth engine that they can then have somebody internally run. And like you just did you do any of the coding? You found some good team members to put it all together for demand magic. Yeah, you don't you don't want me doing coding. So yeah, no, that's uh, what I was going <laughs> you had the idea, the vision, and you kind of brought it all together. Yeah, well a lot of a lot of it's come come about organically. So you know as as you can imagine in the space, you know, a lot of us in you know growth demand and stuff like that, we're a pretty tight knit community. And so, you know, we find ourselves out, you know, a lot of times hacking things together, you know, combining different pieces of tech, you know, sometimes with, you know, duct tape and twine, you know, trying to just make something work. And then, you know, over time, you know, you kind of get that into a place where it's been productized. And, you know, for a lot of us, we're employees at a company. So it's sort of, that's kind of as far as it goes. Like we get it to a place where we can scale it internally. And that's kind of the beginning and the end of it. When I left my previous company, um, you know, I had an opportunity to look at some of those things that I had co-developed with, you know, some of these others for us to use internally. And I was like, this is pretty close to a product. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, hey, let's partner on this, you know, let the the one that was doing kind of the technical side of it focus on the back end of it so that they can actually, you know, focus on the product uh, and not have to spend all of this time in bandwidth selling and then, you know, also servicing clients because, you know, it's a big piece of it, you know, and back to the definition question that you're asking, you know, the technology only does so much if it's not implemented correctly, or you don't understand how it's going to fit into an overall process and stuff like that. And so, you know, it doesn't lend itself to just selling and letting somebody self-serve on it. And so, right. um, you know, for them, it was a problem of, you know, trying to support the the technology side of things, plus trying to service clients, plus trying to go fill pipeline. And so, you know, for somebody like me that gets it and, you know, actually, you know, helped build this out from an implementation standpoint and a need standpoint, I could come in and, you know, take care of that front end side of things and let them just focus on the technology back end. Cool. Can you give us a real simplistic kind of walkthrough of what the, the the tech stack does and like kind of what it looks like in a way? Just like yeah, I mean it's it's fairly flexible and it's actually several different things in there. So it can be everything from you know being able to more effectively scale up uh, you know outbound uh, email sending. Uh, so you know if you've got tighter control over that, you know having a domain that's just dedicated to it you know, using a dedicated sending platform through APIs, you know, going through a multi-week, you know, warming process for that inbox so that, you know, everything, you know, is passing through, you know, as far as, 
uh, you know, what the, the gatekeepers are looking for and stuff like that. And oftentimes we can get deliverability from like the 20, 25 percent that most people are pretty thrilled with up into like the 60, 70, 80 percent open rate range, um, mm -hmm. which is pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got some, uh, you know, tech that allows us to be able to move the rep downstream from uh, trying to get a conversation started on LinkedIn to actually just manning conversations that have been started on their behalf. And so, you know, again, getting right away from or around that 80%, you know, of time and bandwidth being spent on trying to get a conversation going and sort of flip the script where 80% is being you know, spent on actually having conversations and qualifying, uh, you know, prospects and getting meetings set. Um, and then I've got, you know, some tech around building out, you know, customer, uh, you know, CDPs, um, custom for organizations. So, uh, you know, I've got back end data orchestration systems that can go and pull data in from multiple different sources. So, Oh, you know, cool. not just limited to marketing automation platforms or CRMs or, you know, sequencing tools, but being able to go and pull in from, you know, a variety of non-traditional sources. So, you know, hey, who's gone and registered for or shown up for a webinar? Who's particularly engaged in pieces of content that you may have in like a knowledge center? Uh, who's engaged with us in like a Slack community? You know, uh, you know, all the way down to like, what are people hiring for in job boards? You, know, you name it, lots and lots of different, you know, endpoints and uh, uh, intent signals. And at the end of the day, like, I think that's the other trick to what's going on is the those intent signals are becoming more and more critical. Um, I like that. If you don't have effective intent signals that you're using to, you know, identify who your priorities and targets are, then you're increasingly going to be struggling. And so, uh, unfortunately, that's not easy to do. You know, there you know, you're you're really kind of in one of two scenarios. It's either tech that has already built out pre-existing integrations with each other, and so you're you're within relatively you know uh, you know tight confines on that side, or it's going out and using something like you know Airflow or something like that. A, you know, a you know Ferrari you know data orchestration tool that you've got to be a Python programmer to be able to run, but gives you ultimate flexibility to go plug into whatever. And so, you know, what I'm trying to do is sort of bridge the gap and give a middle of the road solution for that. Yeah. I can see why someone would need you <laughs> to hire for <laughs> consulting. I mean, at the beginning I, I was like, okay, so he basically has like a, some technology that'll set appointments for, for the, the call, the sales reps instead of them setting their own appointments, right. With technology. And then you went on and it gets even more complex and even more incredible, but that's awesome, man. <laughs> that, that sounds like quite the project that you've come together. And I, I love the name. So it's demand magic, right? Yep. <laughs> I like that. I think there has to be some magic in a marketing campaign for it to work. And then I, <laughs> so I think you kind of tapped into it, man. Um, so now I want to ask you a, a selfish question. How do people like me, so I'm a growth consultant, how do we get into the world of startups, man? How do you, how do you break in? How do you get in those little inner circles? You know, kind of how, how did you do it or, or how have you been doing it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, I mean, I sort of stumbled into it by starting my own first company, uh, you know, while I was still getting my MBA. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, it wasn't in the SaaS space, but I mean, of course, this was back in the late 2000s where SaaS was still very early. Um, cool. uh, you, know, you didn't even have AWS out there for people to host this stuff on. Most of the, everything was still on-prem. So, you know, I was really kind of there at the beginning of all of that. Um, I just sort of happened to get connected with, you know, two co-founders and joined a company called Cirrus Insight, um, which was a, uh, you know, we made integrations for Salesforce in the inbox. Um, so it was the first hire there. Uh, we were tied at the hip to Salesforce, very deep into the Salesforce ecosystem there. And so, uh, you know, made a lot of connections through that and, you know, just sort of organically over the years, you wind up working with more and more people. But I mean, I think the answer to how do you break into it is the same of how do you break into really anything? Get out there and start talking to people, meeting people, finding opportunities to engage, you know, mm -hmm. uh, communities like, you know, what I mentioned with Rev Genius, they're, you know, very much in, you know, the sales demand gen space within the tech industry. Uh, so it's a great, you know, communities like that are a great place to go and just lurk and get conversations going and seeing what's going on, stuff like that. 
uh, go find thought leaders that you really, you know, respect and connect with and stuff like that. And, you know, one, read everything they have, listen to what they've got out there, you know, uh, and then, you know, reach out to them. You'll, you'll be shocked to find how open most of these people are to having conversations. Um, and at the end of the day, like, you know, ask questions, ask for favors, ask for introductions. Don't be shy. Yeah. Um, but also don't, you know, don't front on what you know and what you don't know, like be honest about it, you know, where you are in that journey, what you're trying to learn and all of that stuff. Yeah. What do you think your demand magic engine is best suited for? Like what kind of startups does it work best for? Does it, is there a specific customer that's like golden for it or that? Won't yeah, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, B2B SaaS, you know, rapidly growing, uh, in that Series A to Series C range, uh, they don't necessarily have to have raised rounds, but mm-hmm. you know that's a good you know sort of proximate uh, you know idea of kind of where they would be in that journey. So, mm-hmm. you know, you've got you know typically you're going to be somewhere between like five and you know fifty million in revenue. You're going to be somewhere between like you know fifty and you know two hundred and fifty employees. Um, and you know, have raised if you if you're going that route, you know, anywhere from you know five to you know as, as high as you know uh, you know a few hundred million dollars. I mean, the the company I was at last year, we raised nearly half a billion dollars in the last year. Um, so, but that one was definitely on the upper range of where where I really am a a good bet. Yeah, but yeah, you know, at the end of the day. Companies that got product market fit, they've got customers, they've got, you know, significant revenue coming through, uh, but they've really got to dial in, you know, processes and operations and identify like what channels are really working, what channels are not, what do we need to double down on, you know, what, uh, you know, how do we really kind of get everything in a place where we can rapidly scale it? That's, that's really kind of where I, I come in and shine is, you know, building that infrastructure that's going to be required to take it from that, you know, three, 5 million to, you know, a hundred million in revenue. Yeah. I feel like SaaS companies, like you really, you got to have more of an edge nowadays. Like it, it used to be like any SaaS company with anything, you could just mm-hmm. blow it up with SDRs and outbound and everything else. And now, your SaaS company has to have like a, a, a little something that the market is really in demand for. But then I feel like if they have something that's uh, that has cutting edge and are able to do your outbound techniques or things like that, that's when you're really going to see massive success. You know what I mean? That's just kind of my thoughts. Since you're in the startup world, do you see any issues with startups lately? Like, do they have a hard time raising money? Is has anything changed? Is it still just going to keep blowing up and keep growing? Like, what is what is your view on it? Oh, we are. We are in the midst of a very tumultuous period in the startup tech space. Mm. Um, so you saw, you I mean, obviously everything got sort of, you know, shaken up and stood on its head with COVID and all of the stuff that we're coming out of. Uh, but it was funny in the tech space, uh, everything got so overvaluated during, you know, COVID and, you know, the last few years, that there was really no good space for investors to go park their money. Uh, real estate had gone through the roof. The stock market was on a tear. Uh, you know, kind of everywhere you looked, uh, you know, uh, you know, valuations were just through the roof on things. And so, right. a lot of people that were sitting on money trying to figure out like, where do I go park this? Settled on you know going and investing in earlyish stage startups, especially in the tech space. And so that's where you saw lots and lots of companies raising insane amounts of money, including the one I was just at. Yeah. Um, and I mean, and a lot of the logic there with that, I mean, we we sat there and straight up said, we've got over a hundred million dollars in the bank since you know our previous raise. We don't need more money. Uh, but people kept coming and banging down the door saying, <laughs> Hey, can we give you some money? And finally we were like, Okay, we'll entertain conversations, but it's going to be on our terms. It's going to be a minimum valuation of this. You're not getting a board seat, you know, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. Uh, and even in spite of those things, people are like, yeah, sign us up. Um, and so, you know, we probably cool. took on 350 plus million dollars that we didn't need to take on just because the market was so frothy and the opportunities were there to do that. Um, and so, you know, you do that and then you rapidly scale up teams, especially sales teams, because you've got all this money and now you've got to prove that you're putting it to work. 
And mm -hmm. that's one of the quickest, easiest ways that you can go do that. That's at least ostensibly tied to increasing revenue. And then you go through a contraction period like we're going right now. And now all of the investors are sitting there looking at their portfolios and going, okay, I'm, I, you know, I'm over leveraged or I made some bets I maybe shouldn't have, or, uh, Hey, I'm, you know, I've been giving a pretty free hand to these investments, but now I'm going to sort of start tightening up and get some more oversight on this and whatever. And that's where you see, you know, these huge layoffs that are going on. I mean, it's mm -hmm. almost every week you hear about a new, uh, you know, uh, you know, series B, series C, series D, you know, range startup that's, you know, letting go of hundreds of people. Um, and it's because of exactly that scenario that's happened. And so, um, like I said, you've, you've got a lot, a lot of stuff going on in the tech space right now in the startup world. Um, and a lot of turmoil. I mean, one of my good friends that, uh, you know, has been a enterprise, you know, account executive, you know, pulling in, you know, uh, 250, 300, 350,000 dollars salaries for the last however many years was part of one of those, you know, 300 person layoffs at a company. Um, and, you yeah, know, so it's, it's a very, very rapidly changing space right now. Secretly in my mind, I'm like, oh, I could help these guys and they're all struggling. So maybe I can go in there, find, find some opportunity, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> that's just a little, little wheels in my head spinning. But I mean, that's intense though. That I'm so happy that they, like you, you were able to share that with me and everybody listening. So I think that's very interesting. I kind of just want to ask you a little bit more about whatever outbound 2.0 is going to be. So I think, I feel like we, we discuss it a lot in depth, but I feel like you're right. There is going to be an outbound 2.0. Got to figure it out. We got to see what it's going to be like. And I think it is a marriage between marketing technology and sales reps and sales teams and things like that. Is that kind of your thinking too? It's like, it's going to be like a, a trifecta of everything coming together to drive the fucking business forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the way I look at it is sort of uh, what happened with marketing and, you know, the, the concept of growth, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and, you know, it's funny when all of that started coming out of Silicon Valley, because it was like, oh, somebody actually put a name to what I've been doing, um, you know, because I was always sort of doing marketing a little different. And, you know, in my opinion, marketing should always be in service of sales and revenue. But, you know, that was actually kind of a new you know, uh, perspective to take on it 10 years ago. Um, and so what happened with the concept of growth was, uh, marketing and demand gen was actually pulled out and given a much broader focus and uh, responsibility, uh, namely getting alignment across, you know, kind of the entire org. Um, and so, you know, properly implemented growth strategies and teams um, are doing not just demand gen, they're trying to optimize around demand gen, around sales, around retention, all the way down to product. And so it's a lot about, you know, building out, you know, true North Star metrics for the entire organization to optimize around. Like, so when I was at Cirrus, we did it around, uh, you know, weekly active users within the app. Um, and it made it really interesting because marketing and demand gen could look at cohorts of people coming in through different channels and say, all right, out of that, how active were they in the app? Uh, sales could look at it and say, okay, uh, you know, what are what are my weekly active users relative to accounts that I'm looking at? Which are the ones that are most likely to close? Which ones are sort of on the cost that I should go focus on? Which are the ones that you know failed to ever get activated and they're probably you know too late to go do something with, and so probably shouldn't do anything with right now. Uh, you know, support success could look at it and say. Uh, uh, hey, you know, these are the ones that are really driving down usage of the app. So those are the, you know, those are the tickets we should really focus on versus these, you know, may have really noisy people about it, but it's not really affecting usage of the app or anything like that. And then product can look at it and say, hey, we pushed out this new feature, this new UI changed and, you know, usage went up, usage went down. But now all of a sudden, everybody's optimizing around the same thing. And so, you know, marketing and demand gen got really, really broad and working with a lot of things. And I think the same type of thing is going to have to happen on, you know, the outbound side of things. Um, you're going to have to have better alignment and awareness of what's going on across the organization and working in tandem with that much better mm -hmm. than what, you know, has been in the past, which for a lot of organizations has been like, Hey, we're going to put, you know, a half dozen, dozen reps and seats, and they're just going to start blasting away and nobody else is going to have any idea what they're doing. They're not going to know what anybody else is doing. And yeah, we're yeah. just going to hope that, you know, meetings come out <clears throat> next. Need smarter sales systems. That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, well, and, and you know, to me, one of the hardest parts of this that's going to be a difficult nut to crack is how do you balance, uh, you know, this higher level of sophistication that we need from reps um, mm -hmm. uh, with them being able to effectively go out and do that, especially given that so many of these have been very early in their careers and stuff like that. And so what do you do around that? And, and I mean, it extends all the way up in the problems that we're all having right now with the technology we've enabled them with, mm -hmm. um, because that technology, while it can make them more effective at, you know, doing what you want them to do, it can also amplify the things they're doing poorly. You know, I mean, like I had, you know, a rep at, you know, one of the companies I worked at that went and raided one of the data providers that we had and loaded up every contact at one of his uh, target companies. And well, started blasting away at them, even though that none of them were like within his persona or ICP or anything like that. And next thing you know, like he's not only like killed his ability to get out in front of everybody, he's killed the entire domain reputation for the entire organization. And now everybody has difficulty trying to get emails to land in people's inboxes, including existing customers. Ooh. Um and so you know, what, what, way, <laughs> what route do you go with that? Do you tighten everything down where they can't get access to a data provider and you've got a gatekeeper that's going and doing that for them? That's not super efficient, but, you know, having the gates wide open invites, you know, the other side of the equation. And so, you know, those existing problems are only going to get, you know, more and more exacerbated. And unfortunately, I don't have a great or easy solution to that other than we should probably be paying as much, if not more attention in getting reps trained on, you know, the process and operations and tech side of things and alignment with broader priorities and demand gen strategies as we are with just, you know, tactics for, you know, pitching, getting on the phone, crafting a cold email, stuff like that, which has really been where the bulk of training and education has been, you know, directed towards these early stage reps. Yeah. It's like, how do you get, so many people educated on how to use the system properly while still having them make money while still understanding why they're doing what they're doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and it just seems like you're, you're basically uh, summarizing a big, um, I guess, problem with just the world nowadays. It's like, when does the technology get so advanced uh, that we don't even know why we're using this technology anymore? You know what I mean? Or the rep that just came in doesn't understand why he's doing all these different things, but it's still there and it's supposed to all work properly. I don't know. We'll just get AI, right? That's pretty much where everything's going. We're going to have a ton of little robot salespeople that just crush it out there. <laughs> well, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's important to remember all of these things are tools and like every right. tool, it's, its effectiveness is based on how you use it. Like it mm. has no inherent effectiveness in its own it has to be put to work and used. And so how effective it is, is going to be dependent on what you're doing with it. Right. <clears throat> well, then also when you're starting a big business and you're trying to build up these systems, you can really get into the weeds and then you don't know what's going on at the lower levels or any level because you're, you're too far above everything, you know, and you're getting too big, you know, so it's a balance. You got to keep it lean. So I just want to ask you, I mean, I know you're, you're kind of more the, the big thinking uh, tech guy, but how have you found good ways to build really high quality sales teams? That, like what have, what have you found that are using all, all these systems and processes properly and just crushing it? Like how, what have, what have been like some differentiators? How do you find good people? Do you have any insight on those? Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the one of the most important things or qualities when it comes to hiring um, and the, you know, this is going to be you know, controversial for some people has very little to do for me, at least uh, with their direct experience or what they're, you know, uh, going out and trying to hire somebody that's done exactly this and exactly this space to the exactly this type of company. What I prefer to do is go out and find people that are two things. Uh, they're highly motivated uh, hustlers. Um, right. They just want to get out there and, and hustle and make stuff happen. And this one is honestly probably the most critical of them. Uh, they're intellectually curious. And if I can find those two things, I can train them to be just about anything and be world-class at it. Yeah. Um, and in fact, some of the best, you know, employees I've had that have gone on to be just rock stars in their in their space and their specialty have been people that I hired with zero background or experience in what they ultimately wound up doing. Um, in particular, hiring, you know, uh, you know, graduates out of, you know, liberal arts colleges that had a major in whatever history, creative writing, like you name it. Uh, 
and you know grown up to be like some of the best you know marketing managers heads of creative kind of you name it web developers that are running you know half dozen person teams at big companies now and and it's because they brought those two two traits to the table you know like i said if i if i've got those two things then i can i can work with just about anybody it, versus if they've got all the experience in the world directly applicable to what we're doing stuff like that but they don't have those two traits Mm-hmm. There's going to be only so far I can take them and so much I can do with them. I think you nailed it. I look for the same thing. So, so hustler, curiosity, and coachability. Those are like my main things. So as long yeah. if you're, if you're going to be a hustler, if you're, you're interested. Yeah. And, and it's, it's such a weird thing. Like I've, I've literally worked with people who have, you know, tons of business degrees and all this stuff. And then like, I'll find some, some kid from New York and the kid from New York just crushes it. <laughs> the guy with all the degrees doesn't do anything. <laughs> it's just like a weird, weird paradigm. So that's interesting. Um, well, I really appreciate you coming on today man. you really blew my mind. We went, we went deep into some, some outbound sales. I love sales. I love talking about this kind of stuff. So this is, this is a, a real joy. Um, I got two questions that I ask everybody that comes on the show before we kind of wrap up. Um, but before we get into that, what are the best ways to get into your world to kind of learn more about what you're doing? You know, how can people find you online? Yeah, uh, so <laughs> easiest way is go to the website demandmagic.ai. Um, you know, you can fill out a form. That'll be the easiest way to uh, to get in touch. You can also uh, you know find me on LinkedIn. Um, pretty engaged and active on there. So you can just look up, you know, uh, Jason Hubbard and Demand Magic and, you know, you'll find me pretty quickly and easily on there. Um, and like I said, you know, pretty active, engaged on there doing, you know, relatively often, at least once a week, you know, LinkedIn lives around, you know, where we're talking about a lot of this stuff. So, um, you know, a variety of different ways to, to get in touch. And then Jason at demandmagic.ai, if you want to shoot me an email. Cool. And I think you mentioned there was something outbound 2.0, like you guys have a live on LinkedIn every week or something like that. Is that what you're talking about? Yep. yep. Every Thursday at one o'clock Eastern. So just follow you on LinkedIn and they'll be able to check that out. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I'm asking because I'm, I'm going to stalk you a little bit on there. I, <laughs> I want to check that out. <laughs> so I think that's awesome. Man. Um, so yeah, the questions that I asked, the first one is, you know, what, what motivates you? What really gets you fired up? What gets you, what gets you doing things? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I I'm results d- driven and data driven, and really everything I do, and I'm highly competitive. So, putting points on the board is what motivates me and drives me. And you know, ultimately, it's a big part of why I you know decided to go back this direction to start you know my own agency again was. You know, I got tired of internal politics and struggles and, you know, spending the bulk of my time trying to get alignment and, you know, people cleared out of the way to go execute. Mm-hmm. Um, even though you could sit there and point to and say like, hey, 80 percent of our pipeline and revenue, which is not an exaggeration, uh, is coming from what we're doing. And in spite of things like that, people are still like, oh, no, we don't want to do it that way or whatever. And it's just like that gets really old. So, you know, part of what I like about <laughs> doing the the agency side of things is you're brought in to deliver results. And so, you know, that's what you're there for. And it allows me to really focus on that side of the equation and, and what I really like to do as opposed to the part that I, I get pretty frustrated with. And, uh, you know, it's the, not, not the best political player whenever it comes to those things, just because I don't have time or patience for it. Yeah, I'm ex-military. So I'm like, this is what you need to do. Do it. And then people don't do it. And I get mad. <laughs> but I like it, man. Get putting points on the board. I love it. Uh, and then the second question I ask is the keyword is impact. What's um one habit or one discipline that you've done or committed to that has you've seen an impact has actually made a result in your life? Yeah, I, I'll I'll use one of those traits that I talked about. It's intellectual curiosity. Mm-hmm. Um always be out there, always be learning, always enjoy, you know, these new things. Don't, you know, don't overstate what you know and you don't know. Be open to learning new things and stuff like that. And, you know, it goes all the way down to, you know, one of the big things I've been doing and reading on recently is actually going into, you know, the psychology behind decision making um, and how do we actually perceive, you know, the world and, you know, make decisions and stuff like that. It actually has huge, huge impact in, how you do things like demand gen Mm -hmm. and you do things like, you know, we get anchored based off of what we have as a reference point. So, you know, I was actually engaging in this exercise with a client the other day and they're trying to figure out how to price packages, you know, and they had priced it starting lowest and then working their way up. And I was like, no, you need to anchor them at a really high price point 
that you actually don't expect anybody to bite on. But that's now your reference point for every other thing that they look at. And so now they're going to go, okay, my reference point is $50,000. And then I've got this other thing that's $20,000. That's now a deal versus if you started at the low end and hey, you know, here's this $2,000 package and we're going to try and work our way up to 20,000. Now you're looking at it within the context of that's 10 times more expensive of where, than where I started. Um, and so we come in, you know, they call them, you know, a combination of heuristics and biases that we bring into decision making. Um, and so, you know, it's getting pretty deep into, you know, psychology and how, you know, people think about and perceive things and stuff like that. But it has huge implications for how you would actually structure these things. Let's unpack that a little bit more. How do you make a decision? How, how do how, what is the, what have you learned? What, what would be like a, a, a key thing to help people make this better decisions? Yeah, well, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, a big part of it is no decision is made in a vacuum. Uh, there is no such thing as presenting a context in which somebody has to make a decision where they are completely free and clear to make an independent decision. So, for instance, uh, you know, even if you want to give them an option of no decision, you have to decide what no decision means. Right. Uh, does the, you know, what is the default within that? Um, you know, and then things like anchoring, uh, you know, what did, what did you prime them with as far as a reference point? What contextually is going on around that decision that they're making and stuff like that? And so, um, you know, in psychology, this is, uh, you know, commonly referred to as nudge theory. Um, so <laughs> like that you're, you know, you're nudging them in the direction of a decision. And, you know, people that really talk about this talk about it you're know, trying to do that in a in such a manner that you're uh, you're maximizing their freedom uh, to make a choice while acknowledging and understanding that that choice is never going to be completely free and clear and that you are going to have some impact and influence on that decision. And so to the degree that you have to have that in there, try and do it as best you can with an eye to what you believe is going to be in their best interest. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, nudge lightly, but nudge in the direction of their, of their better good. Yeah. I like the opportunity loss of not taking action. That's a good, that's a good thing. And then you also, you nudge them in the direction. And then he said, anchor people in a certain position. Those, these are all sales tactics, you know, where this is the psychology of sales. I love this kind of stuff where you just get into people's heads and figure out what they're going on. And there, but there's two different kind of decisions, right? There's, there's a sales decision. And then there's, you know, kind of what we were talking about before, where there's these big high up CEOs with these big businesses and they have to make decisions for their businesses. And I think that there's, there's difference, but it might be interesting to think like, what if, I guess, if you're trying to make decisions for your business, right, you should have empathy for what the customer has to think of, but you also have to have empathy for your business and you have to bring them together. And if the nudge everything together to make sure that everybody's going to be moving in the right direction. I don't know. I, I just was thinking about that. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, and I used to, uh, I'm actually all the dissertation for a doctorate in philosophy. And one of the classes I used to teach was business ethics. And, you know, one of the very early things that we tackled in that was the difference between stockholder and stakeholder models of business. And the stockholder model is, you know, at the, at the heart, maximize value for stockholders do whatever you need to do to maximize returns, maximize value. And so if a lot of people look at that and say like, all right, we should look at things like, you know, compensation as a cost. And so we should keep, you know, compensation down as low as possible um, and things like that. Um, and then stakeholder model says, hey, we should try and balance things across all of the stakeholders. So that can be everything from, you know, the stockholders to the employees, to the community in which the company uh, operates, to the, uh, customers, you know, kind of you name it. Um, and what I kept trying to impress upon my classes was the type, the dichotomy between stockholder and stakeholder models is, in my belief and opinion, a false dichotomy. Um, most companies that are pursuing what they believe is a stockholder model with a really, you know, uh, dialed in focus on returns from investors are more often than not missing opportunities to actually make the company more profitable and valuable that they would have only seen if they were approaching it from a stakeholder standpoint. And so, you know, in, in many ways, and I think this is ultimately the source of most of our problems when it comes to business, uh, it's a myopic and lazy way of looking at and approaching what you're doing to do it under a quote unquote stockholder model. 
Um, and it doesn't force you to really look at things within a you know creative broader context. And so you miss opportunities to actually be more competitive, more profitable, more valuable. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I do have one more question because I got to ask you. So you're in the, in the startup world. Um, as I, as I kind of mentioned before, I'd like to help startups. What do you, what do you think some of the biggest problems or that, that people need solving in, in startups today, or just tech and SaaS and sales today? Like what are some big problems that people need help with or, or CEOs need help with and people running these companies? Yeah. Two, two common things that I see uh, tech companies do as, as mistakes. One, they invest too much in sales, especially manual sales too early on. Mm. Um, in particular, hire, going out and hiring like a VP of sales. Um, right. you, know, uh, you know, I see way too many companies go out and hire a VP of sales that then winds up actually being a player um, I, you know, at a time where they don't need to be doing much coaching um, right. or management of a department. And so you know, that's, that's a pretty high profile, high cost acquisition or hire at a time that you don't really need them and, you know, can't fully leverage them. And same story on like stuff like, hey, we're going to go and build out, you know, a large BDR or SDR outbound team. Um, and that's going to really, you know, drive us, you know, getting the market and stuff like that. Um, and then corollary to that is not investing in marketing and demand gen early enough. Um, companies I've seen in the space that are most affected and have grown most quickly made those investments very, very early on. Um, and a huge, huge distinction between companies that do that. For, and, you know, they sort of go the model that a lot of these technology startups go with. Hey, they've got a technical founder. We've got, you know, some product market fit. We've got some initial customers. We're going to go add some salespeople. We're going to add some, you know, support people so we can hopefully keep some of these people on. And the last piece of the puzzle they really try and tack on their ad there is, you know, marketing or demand gen. Um, and, you know, by that point, like you got a lot of ground that you're making up and you've already, you know, really sort of retarded how, you know, how quickly you can grow and how big you're going to get versus, you know, being able to leverage marketing, demand gen, especially the scale and the signals and the feedback you can get from that and the implications on, positioning and messaging and product and all of those things, uh, you know, I think that that's discounted and not properly valued for way too many early stage startups, especially in the tech space. Wow. <clears throat> so I always thought that you should start outbound um, before you do kind of aggressive advertising. Do you think that's, do you think you should do it at the same time now? I mean, you've kind of made me rethink well, my whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's conflating advertising with marketing. So I'm not necessarily saying, in fact, I wouldn't say to go spend a bunch of money on paid ads and stuff like that. Right, that's um, what I was thinking. You, know, you can leverage that extremely effectively to get signals quick and easy and early on uh, messaging and product market fit and stuff like that. Um, but using paid ads as a demand gen inbound channel, uh, you don't want to do that until you've got strong product market fit. Mm -hmm. you wind up spending a lot of money on people that may not be ready to buy or on a product that is not aligned with what their needs are. Right. Um, you know, early stage marketing for the most part is going to be focused on content creation and getting stuff value add out in front of people. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's critical for a variety of reasons, not the least of that's a pretty long tail strategy. Um, right. You know, a content strategy for demand gen is going to have a minimum of a 90 day lag time from beginning that type of effort in earnest and having anything significant that's going to come out the other side of it. Pretty cool that you you say 90 days. I mean, it just sounds right, but you probably measured it or you figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how much SEO it takes. That's how long anything really takes when you're just trying to do it organically sometimes. But you have to be aggressive with it and you have to be consistent with it for 90 days before you ever see it. And that's one of the biggest problems you see is even when a company says, okay, I get that, I should do that. And then they'll go do it for a month and they don't see significant results and they abandon it. Well, you blew my mind. Uh, well, I, I, one more question. So I, I might not even, you know, know what, what to ask to, you know, kind of help startups or help build sales teams and things like that. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you think is really important that you'd like to share? Again, uh, you know, I think the biggest, best advice I could get for anybody in the space, whether you're a manager, whether you're looking to start a startup, whether you're a CEO trying to figure out how to scale is focus on hiring smart hustlers that are intellectually curious. Um, you know, that yeah. will serve you better than just about anything else you can do. If you can do that, 
then you're going to have people in spots that can be independent, that can be self-motivating, that can go figure out what needs to happen where. Uh, it means you don't have to do micromanaging. In fact, something I tell you know, people as I'm interviewing them almost across the board is, uh, if you, you know, if you come on and you find that I'm micromanaging you, it means that we're probably not going to be working together very long. Um, <laughs> I hire people to be experts and world-class in their piece of the puzzle or their mm -hmm. little, you know, uh, their, their part that they're responsible for. And I expect them to take pride and ownership of that and ultimately do it better than I or anybody <laughs> else at the organization can do. I don't expect them to do that from day one, but I do expect them to get there and get there relatively quickly. Love it, man. I think that's where we're going to end it. Well, that was an awesome podcast, man. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, everybody, for listening. You know, hit us with some, some subscribes, some comments. Uh, go to demand. Is it demandmagic.com? Uh, demandmagic.ai. Dot AI. Check that out. We'll have all the links in the show notes down below. I uh, really appreciate Jason coming on today, man. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. and thanks, everybody, for listening. Have a good day. Talk to you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>